Right, hey guys, how are we doing? Back in another video from Six, and today we are checking out why these shonen battle manga are peak. And we're just gonna get right into it. Fights are an essential part of every popular shonen. Well, yeah, they, they, they definitely are. <laughs> Dragon Ball, Naruto, Bleach, Jujutsu Kaisen, Attack on Titan, Hunter, Hunter, I could go on bam. forever about how fights are probably the biggest parts of these extremely popular franchises, but that would be redundant, we all know that. Uh -huh. Even a series like Death Note, where there isn't really any fist fights, the main focus is an intellectual battle it's between Light fight, yeah, yeah. and L. There's a reason why we all love these series and their fights so much. Not just any fight can attract an audience to read a manga or watch an anime. Well, that's true, yeah. It, it, there has to be something behind it as well. There have been tons of shonen over the years to be cancelled. Even Bleach's anime was subjected to this at one point. Beyond that, though, there's a love that each of these series have for battle, obviously beyond monetary gain. And today, I want to take a look at what is likely the most popular battles from each of these manga, Ooh. and not only explain why we love them, but why this series sets them up for either being the biggest battles or undoubtedly be the most loved in the franchise. Interesting. To be clear, which series I'll be talking about. I mean, Hisoka and Krolo was built up for a while, wasn't it? So like, yeah. It's Dragon Ball, Naruto, and Jujutsu Kaisen. Series like Death Note and Attack on Titan I think are pretty obvious in this regard and I want to save my thoughts on Bleach for its own video. Which is actually uploaded recently. As always, there are chapters below so you can skip around and watch whichever anime you want to watch me talk about first. Before we begin, be sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel as I'd greatly appreciate it. Curious, as eh? Dragon Ball is pretty much the grandfather for all of these anime, I th Wait, Goku Freezer is just phenomenal. I think it's only appropriate to talk about it first. You might disagree on what Dragon Ball's best or most popular fight is depending on where you grew up, but I think the most popular and biggest fight in the series is undoubtedly Goku vs Frieza. Yeah, it's not the best fight, but it's just so goddamn iconic. Solid arguments could be made for Goku vs Jiren as that fight literally shattered the internet every time it happened. I mean, yeah, the internet froze. Crunchyroll was broken on that last episode, man, wasn't it? It's just like, wow. But Goku vs. Frieza is my pick just because of Super Saiyan. One of the things about Goku vs. Frieza that isn't talked about too much is how unrelated these two characters are to one another at the time that they meet. The entire arc, there is no emotional build-up to Goku vs. Frieza. Mm. Toriyama instead decides to focus on building them up based on their completely opposite personalities. Most of the arc has both of them completely away from the rest of the conflict going on. Frieza sits around being yeah, lazy, true. having other people do his work for him. And Goku's constantly getting hurt and having to go back into the healing. And While that. Goku grows stronger on his way to Namek, exploiting his Saiyan biology to become massively stronger. In this aspect, both Goku and Frieza become the sort of champions for their side. So there is a build-up, but like not between them both. Not to each other, but to the reader's knowledge. The Frieza Force has no idea of Goku's existence beyond the vague idea that a Saiyan exists on Earth that fought Vegeta, but Goku and his side know everything about Frieza that's relevant. Since Dragon Ball doesn't like to play around with the morally grey, sympathetic villain stuff too often, the good guys just know that Frieza is the bad guy because he's got an evil large key that they can sense. And an evil large army as well. If you imagine Frieza as an extension of Vegeta, this sort of makes more sense as well. Not an extension in the sense that they are the same character, but Frieza is Vegeta perfected. He's more sinister, more powerful, and has more soldiers at his command. If Vegeta and Goku were already polar opposites to begin with, which is abundantly clear, mm -hmm. there's no need for Goku and Frieza to interact before their meeting for the final battle of the- I mean, yeah, it's, it's done very well. Like, it I, I didn't, I've never really thought about it this way before, but yeah, they don't meet at all until the fight. Right. Let all the other characters yeah. do the build up, then Goku has a reason yeah. to fight outside of just wanting to brawl. We've all seen Goku be the hero by this point, even when he didn't necessarily try to be, and we already believe in him. All we need now is the solid motivation, which Toriyama has come from Vegeta. This part needs no explanation, Vegeta crying to Goku while telling him Frieza is the worst Mate, of the worst, so all while Frieza is smiling, paints the perfect bad guy picture, especially since it's Vegeta of all people who, yeah he's a bad dude, but he's extremely cool so none of us really cared. Aside from that, <laughs> I was looking for a reason why Vegeta isn't more hated towards the beginning of the series, and I think it's because 
he only ever takes out bad guys like Nappa, Dodoria, Zarbon, Kui. Yeah, the people he kills. It's like it's no one. We're, we're always like, oh yeah, they're bad guys. It's like he's fighting bad guys. He's he's getting rid of like what Goku would essentially do if he was there. Any of the Ginyu Force members, it's hard to feel sorry for any of Vegeta's victims. Yeah, they're all examples of Vegeta being a good guy but in a bad way yeah. even his fight on earth he does some heinous things but they were fighting so it's more excusable there back off the vegeta glazing goku versus frieza only gets better once it starts not only is it extremely long which gives the fight room to grow the midpoint of the fight has what is by no stretch of the imagination the most popular transformation in history super super Saiyan. Saiyan. Super watching goku so pick frieza apart finally was just nothing other than satisfying it was fantastic and it's satisfying in a way you don't really get in dragon ball z from this point forward no. even though goku still has cool fights throughout the rest of the series yeah, I mean, like, him against cell is absolutely amazing so he's got his fight with cell yeah his fight with kid boo his fight with majin vegeta he's not lacking in showings but this one was definitely the peak it's the to explain why that is i'd like to unironically use goku's clothes as an example goku first fights with the turtle school symbol being trained by roshi in the saiyan arc this is upgraded and the symbol on his back reflects king kai's training goku's had other teachers in between these two so don't be pedantic the reason none of them have symbols is because they aren't martial arts masters like kami and popo or they only gave Goku a lesson like Korin. Yeah, it's like a, are like a one-off. You get the one-off lesson, it doesn't give you the, the, the symbol kind of thing. Changed once again yeah. after the completion of his training on his spaceship and arrival to Namek to Goku's own unique symbol, as he's now trained himself. And after this arc, Goku bears no symbol because he's no longer a student to himself, King Kai, or Master Roshi, and is now a master training the next generation, and his goals reflect this. It gets sort of muddied in Super, but so does every other thing in Dragon Ball's lore, so whatever. This fight with Frieza was Goku's apex because of what it meant for him. This was his mastery fight. Toriyama pulls this off great in my opinion, but you know, Dragon Ball is all fights and there's nothing else to the story, so let's oh, yeah, move on true. to our next anime, Naruto. Naruto, Naruto is obviously hey. directly inspired by Dragon Ball. Yep. There are even quotes of Kishimoto saying he used to look at Akira Toriyama like a god. So naturally, with Toriyama making fights so popular with his manga, other aspiring artists would want to do the same obviously. thing. Thus, a manga like Naruto was born. Naruto in the beginning even rocks a similar style to Goku with his orange and blue suit. Naruto's most popular fight, just like Dragon Ball's, is pretty controversial. Naruto has tons of S-tier fights that could be in the running for this position. Kakashi vs. Obito, Rock Lee vs. Gar. Kakashi Obito is just phenomenal, but again, that had loads of build-up and had a lot of emotion behind Bro, it. Sasuke vs. Itachi, Naruto well, mate, Sasuke vs. Itachi had loads of build-up as well. Vs. Pain. The list goes on and on, but my pick here has to be Naruto and Sasuke's second fight. Ooh. Interesting. Because part one finished off with that amazing like fight where they're younger and they're just getting their transformations and stuff. Mm. Naruto is unlike Dragon Ball in the sense that Kishimoto very much so wants his series as a whole to have the finale, where Toriyama gives each saga of his story a gigantic send-off. That's true. Sasuke's growing hatred and Naruto's growing understanding of hatred come together and create this perfect clash of ideology at the end of the series. Two that cannot coexist at the same time, justifying the fight beyond just a rivalry needing to be settled. Take this in contrast with their first fight, where Naruto couldn't really understand Sasuke because of his blatant ignorance on Sasuke's situation, thinking they were so similar where their situations differed by one major detail, that Naruto was alone since the beginning of his life, and Sasuke lost, lost the ones family. he loved later yeah. on in his life, after he had already formed all of those connections. This second fight doesn't have any of the understanding issues and the field, at least ideologically, is even this time around, making for an all around more conclusive battle than the first time. Everything Naruto has learned from the people of the past, he treasures and wants to keep with him, while Sasuke wants to sever the past as it's full of nothing but bad things. And you can really see where both of them are coming from in this fight, and the mm. positions here perfectly reflect the journeys they've been on up to this point. I don't want to say Sasuke's been through the absolute worst anyone could ever go through, but he hasn't been through the best either. 
they, they've had a lot happen. <laughs> like, Throughout yeah. the story, Sasuke's growing hatred doesn't just get aimed at one thing. He's initially against ending lives, obviously with the exception of Itachi, who all his hatred was aimed at. And after that's accomplished, his mental state starts to spiral downwards, both due to Obito's influence and the burden of his own genetics. Sasuke's next step is kidnapping and essentially sentencing B to death by delivering him to the Akatsuki. After that he aims higher and his target is the higher ups of Konoha, that being Danzo and the Elders. Aiming higher again after growing in hatred is Konoha itself, the entire village, and this goes all the way out to the world itself and wanting to destroy it. After talking to the Hokage, Sasuke wants to, instead of that though, destroy the world and then rebuild a new one. Everything he's going through makes him think the current world is trash, so why not get rid of it and make a new we'll one? Start over. His goal yeah. is even similar to Madara's and Obito's, he just wants to do it in the real world instead of a dream sequence. Naruto, on the other hand, gains understanding from all of his interactions. Even against an enemy like Pain, he gets a great understanding and is rewarded for it. I genuinely think that Naruto saying he won't kill Pain, but won't forgive him either, is one of my favorite moments in the entire series. And for not killing Nagato, he gets all the villagers brought back to life. Yep. Naruto even learns from Sasuke's greatest enemy, that being Itachi, about not doing everything alone and letting others help him even though he has this great power. So Naruto and Sasuke standing before each other with burn the past versus keep the past philosophies makes perfect sense. This is all on top of this just being an amazing fight. I'm going to speak for the anime here, when I first watched Naruto in 2019 and got to this point, keep in mind, I watched it with no spoilers, I had no idea what would happen. When Naruto and Sasuke started throwing hands, my mouth dropped. It's great, it's phenomenal. I was so shocked they were fighting the way they did. Sasuke using the diva path of the Renegon, mm -hmm. the clash of Injur's arrow and the double Ross and shuriken, everything about the actual fight itself was great to me it's and I couldn't boom. have asked for it's a better send-off fight for the franchise than this. It's I want to talk about Jujutsu Kaisen next since as you can tell by my channel I'm really into You're really getting into it man, yeah, yeah, yeah. Years at this point. But before talking about Jujutsu Kaisen, I want to talk about one of the series that inspired it the same way I did for Naruto and Dragon mm -hmm. Ball and that's Hunter x Hunter. Heck yeah! Hunter Hunter is my sixth favorite anime manga of all time, just behind Death Note, but aside from that, it has what I consider my fifth favorite fight in anime manga with Hisoka vs. Krolo. Oh. I mean this when I say, I think if Hisoka vs. Krolo was coming out today, it would have Gojo vs. Sukuno levels of excitement. Yeah. Words can't describe how happy I was when I found out this fight actually happened after watching the Hunter x Hunter anime. Yeah, this like, fight it's is nice to see that the they actually first get volume it happen. of manga I ever bought, volume 34. Yeah, it's, it's cool because you want us to know what happens. You want to know what happens next, and it's like, oh wow, so they actually do throw down. Cool. Just so I could see what happens. Hisoka hunts the down. Man, for the longest like, oh. time, Hisoka wanted to fight Krolo, and we get blue balled with it at the end of the yep. new city arc. The fight happening so much later in the manga and at such a random point in time makes it even more special to me for some reason. It's like a surprise. Mm. Like, here's the best fight at chapter 351. I'm going to get a bit ahead of myself here and draw comparisons to Jujutsu Kaisen's biggest fight, but I think it's obvious I was going to pick Gojo vs. Sukuna to be that anyway. Okay. For this fight, I want you to imagine I've, Gojo I've, I've, as Hisoka I've, I've and okay. Sukuna as Krolo. Some good points of comparison off the bat is Hisoka's want for a good fight similar to Gojo, and how being pressed is making him happy, and how Krolo has stolen techniques similar to Sukuna. I think another thing that's a fairly direct reference is after Krolo and Sukuna's plans both play out the way they want it when Hisoka's and Gojo's arms both get taken off is this reaction they both have. All Beyond right. the dialogue where Krolo says good, Sukuna says very good, the panels are also drawn pretty similar. The last point of comparison I'll make is the fact that Krolo very clearly has the upper hand with his abilities, but Hisoka makes a very unique use of his one ability to cover the difference. I think it's similar to Sukuna having the 10 shadows and the different abilities it comes with and Gojo having to use the limitless in different ways like making red swing around the building or creating a hollow purple in midair. Beyond that though, Hisoka vs Krolo is just a great fight. It's really short, spanning from chapter 351 to 357, Seven. and while I think it's great for Hisoka, it's better for Krolo, and showing off how crazy dangerous Skill Hunter can be when he expands his creativity, 
He's making use of four different abilities at once in this fight, and not one time is he ever at a real disadvantage. Yeah. It's just an overall great showing of Nin. Jujutsu Kaisen is currently my third favorite in a manga of all time, following Dragon Ball and Naruto, and I think its biggest fight, like I previously mentioned, is Gojo vs. Sukuna. Yeah, this fight has been set up since me. chapter 3 of the manga, and it doesn't disappoint for a single panel while the fight is going on. I think it's fair to bring up in this instance the insane amount of hype this fight got week to week, and all the memes that came out of it. It was truly a you had to be there type of experience. The level of hype JJK had during these weeks and how everyone came together was similar to the time Goku was fighting Jiren back in 2017. Not quite as hype since it's not Goku, but very, yeah. very hype. This doesn't increase the overall quality of the fight, but for me and a lot of people I talk to, it definitely increased our enjoyment of the fight. As for building up the fight, I think you could point to a lot of things. Obviously, one would be mentioning the fight in Chapter 3. I think another fairly underrated one is Naobito using Falling Blossom Emotion on Dagon's domain since that move was never used again until Gojo used it in his fight with Sukuna. Huh. One I think is pretty interesting is Gojo mentioning that a 6 size user previously fought a 10 Shadows Technique user and that's why the Zenin clan and Gojo clans are on bad terms to this day. There is an art from a key animation volume 2 cover that has Megami fighting Gojo, which wow, I think under these false. circumstances we can all now conclude was build up for this fight, since in the series there is no reason for them to be fighting. This last one is more me thinking it, but building hype by consistently calling them both the strongest was genius on Gege's part. As for the fight itself, it's fantastic, by far the longest fight in the series, and it's got the coolest combat hands down. I think the conclusion to this fight though is different from the others I've talked about so far in a very interesting and refreshing way. Gojo's loneliness in being alienated from the rest of humanity because of his strength alone sort of sets him up to have to die the same way he lived. That being of course alone. alone. Wow. He even says this to Megami in a flashback, giving Megami a reason to stop making the sacrifice play because no matter how many allies you have around you, you die alone. This is interesting for two reasons. The first being, he says this in response to Megami asking him if coordinating with other sorcerers is important, which Gojo quite literally cannot do because he's so strong. The second reason I'll mention in just a second, but this quote tells me that Gojo thinks he's destined to always be alone no matter what. Even in death, he won't be able to be connected to anyone else again. Now, back on track, the second reason the quote is interesting though, is that after mm -hmm. Gojo's death, he's quite literally not alone like he thought he would be. He's with Ghetto, Haibara, and Nanami, all people from the past who have also died. Not only is he not alone, he's taken on the form of himself as a teenager, the last time to our knowledge he wasn't lonely because he had Ghetto right there with him, and they were the strongest instead of Gojo being the strongest on his own. Whether or not this is a dream sequence or not doesn't really matter. The point is, the end of Gojo's character is satisfying and the end of the fight by proxy because it gets paid off in this way. That's obviously ignoring any revival theories, by the way. Hmm. Interesting. I want to check out a lot of Six's Jujutsu Kaisen videos, and I think what I'll do is, um, I'll make it. Yeah, this makes sense. So I will next it, it, 2024. So I've got a week. Huh, make it so that I'm going to be catching up with Jujutsu Kaisen and I'm going to check out Yu Yu Hakusho and I will do Jujutsu Kaisen and Yu Yu Hakusho related videos next year. How does that sound? Does that sound alright? Does that sound good? Because I'm looking forward to it. I want to check out Totally Not Mark's reviews for uh, Yu Yu Hakusho. Um, he's done a comparison with the live action so I have to watch the live action as well which is fine. And uh, Jujutsu Kaisen. I think I'll just watch the anime. You know? And then maybe read the manga. Why not? <laughs> but anyway, thank you to my patrons. Oh, and what do you think about my hat? I love this hat. My brother got this me for Christmas. I think it's nice. He, he, he said he got it because it's more subtle than me. My other hats, because I actually go out in public wearing my loud anime hats, and it's quite funny. My dad is like, what's that? And then like, then my brother was like, 
Okay, something that's a little bit, a little bit more subtle, a little bit more. Yeah. But anyway, thank you to my patrons. If you want every name at the end of every video, I upload links in the description to the Patreon page. Or oh, and down there, I'm Emphasize Sports Channel. It's great to be thank you for that. Thank you all. For watching, what do you guys think of that? Do you guys think of this? Click like, subscribe, if you haven't already. Leave comments down below. Let me know what you're watching to go see future videos. I'll see you guys all you guys next time.